Hello scholars, welcome. I'm Mr. Denny, and today we're talking about the rise of conservatism. Uh, our objective today is to be able to explain the rise of the conservative movement uh, and its effect on society starting in 1974, eventually affecting today's society. Uh, hopefully you have your lecture notes out. I've got my Google Doc here on my phone. Remember, you don't have to request permission or, or access. Just make a copy, and then you can either type it in the Google Doc, print it out if you're so inclined, uh, whatever is your preference. So let's go ahead and get started. This graphic here of the, the election results in 1980, little preview of what's going to be coming up. Uh, so before we can talk about the rise, I guess the actual conservatism, let's talk about what leads up to it, what, what gives it uh, the the cause of creation, right? Um, so remember that Richard Nixon is president in the early 70s, um, and the big scandal with Richard Nixon, hopefully the word that popped into your head, is Watergate, right? So Richard Nixon has to resign because of the Watergate scandal. Well, otherwise, he was going to be impeached, right? Um, and so his vice president, Gerald Ford, ends up taking over. And Gerald Ford was generally seen as, as an honest guy. He's a uh, pretty calm, reserved, conservative guy. And it's thought that he's going to be the one to heal the United States. Think about all the turmoil that the U.S. has been through, uh, especially in 1968, right? So we, we've got Watergate, uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, we have the Vietnam War, we have the assassination of Robert Kennedy, right? So he's seen as the guy who's going to be able to heal the nation. Uh, but then he goes and he pardons Richard Nixon, right? He calls off the investigation. Nixon gets off scot-free, doesn't really face any uh, kind of legal consequences for Watergate. And at that point, Washington and, and I guess the rest of America, they begin to turn on Gerald Ford. And he's seen as just another politician, someone who spent too much time in Washington. Um, nowadays, if we look back and pardoning Nixon was maybe the right move. Otherwise, the United States was going to get wrapped up in this investigation when there are some bigger problems in the United States to deal with. What are those problems? Well, we can look down here. Uh, we've got two big things. One, high inflation. Prices of things are slowly going up, and yet people aren't making any more money. Uh, we also have high unemployment, right? Uh, people are more and more less able to afford these things, and those things are getting more expensive, right? So Gerald Ford's big solution, remember he's a conservative, and conservatives typically want a smaller government. Uh, Gerald Ford's solution here was to whip inflation now. So he had the, he's, these buttons printed up, he gave a speech, uh, and his government program was basically just, can we get everyone to stop buying stuff? right? Uh, people don't really react positively to the president telling them to just stop buying stuff and it'll get better. Um, and so this high inflation, high unemployment ultimately results in this thing called stagflation. Stagflation, right? So things are just remaining stagnant. Nothing is changing. Nothing is getting better. I mean, it could get worse, but uh, Gerald Ford is seen as not really tackling this problem of stagflation very effectively. Uh, this opens him up to be challenged by a Democrat named Jimmy Carter. President Jimmy Carter was originally the governor of Georgia, uh, and Carter was originally in the Navy, and he was, after the, he left the Navy, he was a peanut farmer. And so he's seen as a man of the people, someone you could relate to, uh, and that's what he runs on. That's his platform, is he's an outsider. He didn't have anything to do with Vietnam. He wasn't a part of Watergate. He hasn't been in Washington getting corrupted by politics. Uh, he had nothing to do with causing the recession. Um, he's seen as kind of this fresh voice, this fresh uh, perspective who people can relate to. Um, so President Jimmy Carter wins 1976. He wins that election. Not by a ton. You can see here, it's pretty close electoral vote-wise, right? Popular vote-wise, it's pretty close. Um, but, but Carter wins the presidency. And Jimmy Carter's presidency, I'll move my little bubble here. Jimmy Carter's presidency uh, is primarily about global human rights, uh, stopping countries, being diplomatic about countries that are violating human rights, also looking out for the environment. Uh, Jimmy Carter installed solar panels on the roof 
of the White House, for example. Uh, maybe his most significant accomplishment would be the Camp David Accords. Uh, Jimmy Carter was able to mediate, was able to basically broker a peace deal between Egypt and Israel. Uh, one of the, the biggest issues in the Middle East, and still today, uh, was conflict between um, is the Islamic community and the uh, Jewish community. And so he was able to broker this peace deal between these two big players in the Middle, Middle East. Um, however, he, he also had probably more uh, trouble during his presidency than he did victories. Uh, big trouble, point of trouble here, would be the Iranian hostage crisis. Uh, the country of Iran didn't like who the United States was supporting in Iran, they had two different leaders, um, and, and so people in Iran took over the American embassy. They held 50 Americans hostage for over a year, uh, and Jimmy Carter, despite all of his efforts, uh, he tried di being di diplomatic, he tried uh, economic consequences, he even tried a rescue mission, all of it failed. Uh, and so that, along with that bad economy, the high inflation that still carried over from Gerald Ford, um, caused the standard of living to decline, right? People's standard of living went down for the first time since World War II. Uh, and he, he's generally seen as someone who wasn't able to tackle that issue very well. And, and he addresses the American public around this time in what's called the crisis of confidence speech. We'll take a look at it. But essentially, in this speech, he's telling the American people, we've lost confidence in ourselves, we lost confidence in our government, we got to buckle down. But people only heard that first part. They only heard the negative part where they were like, it's your fault, we, we've kind of lost sight of things. So let's take a look at that, uh, at his crisis of confidence speech, if I can get the computer to cooperate. Uh, so let's go here. And so let's just take a listen. Listen for the tone. Listen for his word choice. Imagine you're one of the people at home watching this. Uh, and just imagine, am I filled with hope after listening to the speech? Let's take a listen. Economic power and military might. The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. Our progress has been part of a living history of America, even the world. We always believed that we were part of a great movement of humanity itself called democracy, involved in the search for freedom. So I'll pause it right there. And you can hear there, uh, it's kind of got this depressing tone. He's talking about how, like, America used to believe in these things. What happened? Uh, and, and that wasn't the uplifting message that people were looking for at this time. Um, and if we look at how he approached as president, these problems, we can see, I mean, data-wise, not very effective. As president, he tried to attack uh, the energy crisis. He tried to attack stagflation, the recession. What's the result? Uh, inflation hit 14%. Interest rates soared. People couldn't get loans. Uh, and gas prices especially increased so much uh, that what you see in this picture was, was pretty common throughout the 70s. Long lines just to get a tank of gas. Um, and, and so... Here, this opens up just like uh, Ford was opened up to a defeat by Carter. This opens Carter up to a defeat uh, by who? This guy named Ronald Reagan. Before we even before we even look at this slide, uh, let's take a look at uh, what's Ronald Reagan about. What do people know about Ronald Reagan when he enters the scene? Here. First. So there's Ronald Reagan, right? This is from like the, the late 1950s. Ronald Reagan, this guy was an actor uh, who then went on to be the governor of California. He previously ran against Gerald Ford like eight years before this. Um, and he said the problem is not the American people. The American people haven't 
uh, lost confidence in themselves and they haven't lost sight of democracy. He says, no, the problem is Washington. It's the politicians. It's the American leaders. Uh, so this guy being an actor, he's referred to as the great communicator. He's got this smile. He's got this energy. He's got this positivity that the American people are like, I like the way he's saying it. It might be the same message as the previous presidents, but the way he's delivering this message uh, makes me feel good about the future. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the messages that, that Ronald Reagan used was, uh, think about it, has your life improved in the past four years? And most people were like, no. And they blamed uh, President Carter for that. And, and that's kind of what allows Ronald Reagan to propel towards victory. Uh, during his campaign, uh, Ronald Reagan uses the slogan, Make America Great Again. That might sound familiar to you, uh, but, but that kind of originates here with Ronald Reagan, uh, despite what other sources may say. Uh, and the election of 1980 is a landslide. Can I get the thing to... Here we go. So from the original slide, right? Uh, look at this. Look at how much red is on here. Uh, Ronald Reagan wins this here. And, and it's in large part due to the failures of President Carter to address the problems here at home. Um, his failures with the hostage crisis, right? The hostages are still... They're still in Iran when the election is happening. Uh, and they actually were able to broker a peace deal... But the hostage takers in Iran were like, we specifically don't like President Carter and we're not going to release the hostages until Ronald Reagan becomes president. Like, that's how much they did not like uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, and so here you can see as soon as Reagan took oath as the president, minutes later, 52 U.S. hostages in Iran fly to freedom after uh, being stuck there for over a year. Uh, and let's take a look at what Ronald Reagan is like. Right. So like what exactly is so magnetic about his his personality? What what drew people to him? Uh, so take a look here. This is a part of a debate, a presidential debate. Ronald Reagan uh, was 69 years old. He was thought to be too old to run for president. Look at how he flips that speaking point here during a debate. Weeks and cast it specifically in national security terms. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. So you can see there, uh, he, he's got jokes, he, he's a good uh, public speaker, um, and, and he's... He knows how to take things that might be negatives about him and flip those into positives, right? Uh, so he does extraordinarily well during debates, during speeches, um, and that's what helps people, uh, you know, take his side. Another big thing is that Ronald Reagan wanted to see kind of a return to original family values. Um, and the religious uh, community in the United States, they really latch on to that. Uh, and so there's a reverend by the name of Jerry Falwell and what's called the moral majority. Uh, and they finance a lot of his presidential campaign, as well as campaigns across the United States, to get rid of uh, people who were liberals, to get rid of people who were Democrats, to really give Ronald Reagan and his vision as much support as possible. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe the biggest... Uh, contribution of Reagan's that continues to this day is this idea of Reaganomics, or uh, if we're being technical about it, supply-side economics. Uh, and Ronald Reagan's vision for how do you uh, fix the recession, how do you fix stagflation in the United States, was uh, cutting taxes um, for businesses and wealthy individuals in an attempt to create economic growth. So his idea here with supply-side economics was if you cut government spending and if you cut government agencies, if you cut government programs, if you kind of trim things down while also cutting the taxes, right, cutting how much you're taxing people, that that's ultimately going to stimulate the economy, uh, that if people are saving money at the top, that it's eventually going to trickle down to where people are making more money. 
um, and that money is going to eventually get passed up to the top, right? So that's that's supply side economics, Reaganomics, trickle down economics has a lot of different names. Um, in practice, as well as the deregulation of businesses, right? So like with less government, uh, there's less government looking out on on what businesses are doing. Uh, in, in practice. Uh, it, it kind of is more to what you see in this image down here, uh, which is, let's go back. Uh, if someone were to pour money at the top, the money just kind of stayed at the top. And if we look at data here, we see that trickle-down economics, Reaganomics, disproportionately affected the lower classes in that uh, they retained very little of the wealth in the United States. Let's look at this graph here. Um, you can see right here, 1982 to 1990, as well as 1975 to 1979, right? You see this big jump here in who holds uh, or who gets most of the income growth in the United States. Uh, here, it's the bottom 90% are getting most of the income growth, right? And then you hit 1982, you hit Reaganomics and when his policy starts to take effect and the top 10% just shoot up and, and that stayed true even to now, right? Uh, and so trickle down economics doesn't really pan out the way it was sold. Uh, a couple of other criticisms of Reagan's administration would be one, and we talked about this last class, his his failure to respond to the AIDS epidemic. Uh, by the time he spoke about it for the very first time, 36,000 Americans had been diagnosed, over 20,000 had died. Uh, and as well during the Reagan administration, he also increased the war on drugs. So President Nixon had already been fighting the war on drugs. Uh, Reagan kind of uh, you know, did it times 10. He increased funding for police, uh, and he also uh, instituted mandatory minimum sentences. So people who are arrested for certain drug offenses didn't matter what the circumstances were. You were getting a minimum prison sentence, 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, and, and again, this ends up disproportionately affecting minorities, disproportionately affecting uh, the, the lower and, and middle class. Um, and here you see uh, Nancy Reagan, his wife, she headed up this, the war on drugs campaign with her famous slogan, just say no. Simple as that, right? Uh, so Ronald Reagan as well, his foreign policies, uh, he expanded the military budget. Uh, he instituted this program that, that didn't end up working out called Star Wars. Uh, so he wanted to get satellites up into space. Uh, and with those satellites, they would be able to take out any missiles that might attack the United States. Like they could shoot it with a laser and take out the missile. This ended up not being possible, but... Uh, very fun sounding program. By the way, secret word for the lecture is going to be lasers because it's a good word. Lasers. Uh, as well, talking more about foreign policy, uh, the biggest conflict with Reagan would be what's called the Iran Contra affair. Uh, the Reagan administration secretly sold weapons to Iran to try and fund uh, this group of Nicaraguan Contras or like rebel fighters. Uh, so that was actually illegal. My cat was playing with a toy. Uh, that was illegal, but nonetheless, uh, Reagan was able to kind of talk his way out of it and say, I knew nothing about what the, my administration was doing, selling weapons to fund an uprising in Nicaragua, right? He's a great speaker. Uh, as well on that military budget, as well as lasers, as well as the Iran-Contra affair, that big military budget eventually forces the Soviets to back down from Berlin. Remember the Cold War. Never forget the Cold War. Uh, Berlin was still divided, and it's Reagan's kind of military policy, as well as reducing uh, nuclear arms and, and his diplomacy, his skill as a speaker, that eventually leads to the opening up of Berlin, which had a wall in it, and it was divided like this whole time, right? This whole time we've been talking about history. Uh, so some key accomplishments there. So, in conclusion, what do we take away here from Ronald Reagan? Well, trickle-down economics still a huge thing today. Economists still have arguments about whether or not it's effective, whether or not it works. Uh, but no doubt, it's, it still has some effects on society today. And that's kind of the second point here, is that 
politics, the economy, the society, we all continue to be affected by and compared to the policies and the public image of the Reagan administration. People compare even the current president to Ronald Reagan. People compare uh, you know, society and politics to how did Reagan do it, right? He's seen as kind of sparking off the conservative movement, and he's seen as a conservative figurehead uh, for conservatives, but as, as well as the, the Republican Party as well. Okay, so we rushed through like 20 years of history there. We know about Reagan. We know about the rise of conservatism. Uh, move on to the next thing. I'll see you next class.